Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today, I'm privileged to welcome a very, very senior and well-known academician, Vandana Chavla. Vandana, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you, Ashutosh. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Uh, Vandana is the principal of New Era Public School, New Delhi. She has received the Delhi State Teachers Award for Excellence. And when she has a little free time, she's a well-known jewelry designer under the brand Vintage Intention. Yes. Vandana, tell me, what would you say are three key milestones in your life or your career? So you have to specify life or career. You want I'll me leave to leave it to you to choose. Okay. Hmm. So I think that my life is more important than my career. Okay. So I will talk about the three milestones in my life. Mm-hmm. I think the first was the birth. Okay. Uh, I think that I was born to very forward-thinking parents, mm-hmm. uh, extremely practical and. Uh, I think the values they taught us Mm. were something that was uh, absolutely essential growing up and have held me in very good stead for the rest of my life. So Mm. that I think is a first milestone. The second one is I think when I got married, because uh, if you have a successful marriage, Mm. I think it is one of the best things on this earth because Mm. you have a companion who supports you, who cares for you, who grounds you, who tells you like it is. uh, And that can keep you very focused in life. So I think two. The third I would say in my life is I am a cancer survivor. And I had 18 years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. That was a wake up call for me because till then I was postponing a lot of things which I felt, okay, now's not the time to do this. We will do this when we have more money. We will have, I will do this when I have more time. I will do this when the opportunity arises. And that was a wake up call which made me realize and understand that that time is now. If I want to do it, it has to be done as per my timeline and not something in the nebulous future which will or won't take place. So I think you said only three, but I could go on for okay. about at least six or seven. But, but so these much, are the so much more about you that we want to talk. So okay. But what what amazing milestones. Thank you. So let's talk about your journey as an educator. Yeah. Uh, tell me about New Era Public School, when you started it and What were some of your challenges as you built it? Okay, so the truth is, Ashutosh, I didn't start the school. The school was started by my mother in the year 1960. That was the year I was born. Mm. So I was born with the school, so to speak. Mm. And it is a journey um, uh, of uh, immense pride because I saw my mother Mm. taking the very difficult steps that it takes to uh, set up an organization as a woman. You must remember that this is way back when uh, she was perhaps one of the only women in her entire family or her social circle. And for many years after that, uh, who worked, you know, who worked for a living. In those days, it was considered kind of a kind of a slur on the uh, perhaps capability of the husband if the wife went to work. Right. And most families did not encourage uh, their women to work. And she was very blessed because she had a father who said, Are you doing BH kara hai? Tumko kuch karna chahiye. So, you know, and my father, as I said, that a ma- good marriage can be something amazing. Okay. So my father was a great support. He said, Definitely, please do it. Mm. But he put a very uh, interesting condition. He said, If you start it, I will not let you give it up. Mm. Very nice. So if you want to do it, you have to be determined mm-hmm. that you are going to take it forward. And eventually, uh, well, she worked very, very hard and she was able to get some land from the government of India and then set up the school uh, in the premises where it is today. And I kind of organically got Good. myself there. 
Mm -hmm. uh, first part time, and then I think by the age of 21, I was firmly ensconced in the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have worked there as a middle school teacher of English mm -hmm. um, and high school teacher of English, mm -hmm. as a head of department, as a vice principal. And about 16, 17 years ago, I was principal. So, so that is the journey. Fantastic. And as you were building it, yeah, you know, and, and now the school is well known and recognized for its excellence. What have been some of your key challenges? <laughs> okay. So one challenge that I think somehow I never kind of uh, faced up to was um, aggression from parents. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, whatever you might say, a principal is still a bit of an ivory tower resident mm -hmm. sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, that is something, not anymore, but in the initial stages as a te teacher, as a supervisor, I think one of the biggest challenges was facing people and their criticisms. Mm -hmm. Perhaps at that time, I was not so fully invested in the school in terms of emotionally, mentally, spiritually, intellectually. Mm -hmm. The more invested I became in the school intellectually, I realized that there is absolutely nothing that anyone can say to face me because I know and my conscience knows that what they are seeing and saying mm -hmm. is something from the other side, which is not true, actually, mm -hmm. because we have to put forward to them mm -hmm. uh, the process through which we get where we are. You know, sometimes people see only one side of something and they say, well, you're not doing this and you're not doing that. It may be so from their angle, but the fact of the matter is we are catering to 3000 children. So sometimes what they see is only a very, very small part of the picture. They miss the woods for the trees, so to speak. So this was a very big challenge for me. The other challenge I find which might sound extremely, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, frivolous, mm -hmm. is a lot of people would come and say, we have English medium school mein apne bacche ko bheja hai. Mm -hmm. bacche English nahi bolta. So I would say, okay, do you speak English at home? No. Does your society or the, the atmosphere in which the child is raised or the family, friends or the people he meets, do they speak English? No. Okay, then he's only speaking or exposed to English for four or five hours a day and the rest of the day he's not um, exposed to any English. So why don't you try some things yourself? Then I had a very interesting conversation once with a parent in a public parent-teacher meeting where people were saying that, you know, my child doesn't speak in English. And that has changed, by the way, in the past 12 years. And I will come to that also, why it has changed. Mm -hmm. And this parent raised her hand and she said, you know, I beg to differ. My parental family and home is in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And I take my kids there every year for about a month. And I find that when they go to Calcutta, they converse with their cousins and everybody in English. But when they come to Delhi, uh, and this is Askur is in West Delhi, which is a very Punjabi area, okay? When they come here, they forget English. They will not speak in English because uh, they want to be one with the group of people they are hanging out with. So because their so-called cohorts don't speak in English, so they don't speak in English either. So this was another challenge. And I think the last challenge, which I trying to face even till today, we as a school is mm -hmm. that public education, which is actually private education, given the name public education and public schools, gets a bad press from just everybody who thinks that there's nothing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're only making money. Mm -hmm. And that is not the case at mm -hmm. all. You see, that is perhaps the biggest challenge that exists today to be able to convey to the general public at large that public schools or the so-called privately run schools are doing such a stellar job of educating their society's children. You know, and that they have to be given credit for that rather than face brickbats all the time. Oh, absolutely. I think what a lot of people don't recognize and realize that this thriving middle class of India yes. 
is based the product of the public school system of this of our country absolutely you know okay so let's keep moving on yes uh, you know you've been in education as you said all your life yes and you actually just walked into education in your own school yeah uh how have you seen education evolve uh since the time you got into it okay for one thing i do think that our government mm -hmm. and the policies that the government is putting in place and shaping mm -hmm. are working a lot towards changing the face of education uh they might not give us a lot of time to change that sort of thing mm -hmm. but i do think that the kind of policies that are being implemented for example there was a time when the only way forward was rote learning so rote learning is given less and less weightage now the other thing that i find that is happening is that uh, there's a lot of project work that is being made compulsory mm -hmm. you know so children have to do their research have to ensure that they are uh, doing their best to you know get to the uh, real essence of what they are trying to um, study mm -hmm. there are practical applications of the work that they are doing uh, from the textbook and how it applies to daily life right. so that in itself i think is a very important thing in the past many years now a lot of emphasis is being given to art education and how art fits in not only as art mm -hmm. but how every subject has some kind of a component mm -hmm. that can be taught through some kind of art and creativity right uh sports is being given far more importance mm -hmm. than it was given earlier so one thing i think is that the second thing i think that parents are becoming more aware mm. of their personal responsibility right there was a time in the beginning when i started working the parents felt that everything is the responsibility of the school correct and the parent is paying the fees and at the end of the day it's the school's job to do everything else mm. that's not the case and i think the more educated parents are getting the more involved they are becoming so i think that that's a very good sign that's good fantastic and you know uh, when i was growing up and i did the old isc the indian uh, the, the cambridge I, the cambridge uh, certificate you know uh, no it was the the, the, the senior cambridge okay uh, before right. the icsc and all that uh, okay a lot of it was rote as you just spoke about it yes and uh, even later the indian education has always been blamed for being a pressure cooker system i mean yeah. india and yeah. china and yeah. yet we seem to be producing some incredible talent so what so is it me... that, what is it that india is doing right i don't want to get into a criticism no we are not saying but i will tell you one thing huh. that rote memory uh, memory is a skill hmm. that must be acquired okay see it's however much you might want to uh, kind of criticize it to get rid of rote memory is like throwing the baby out with the bath absolutely let me share with you an anecdote that has just come to my uh, consciousness just about last week i was in the us okay. visiting family and i have uh, uh, my brother in law who's who has two boys and both of them uh, are in medicine the elder one has finished his md degree and whatever is working towards getting his speciality and the younger one has just finished his md from uh, an institution in milan mm -hmm. but now gone back to uh, the us so that he can uh, enter the us medical force okay. now he's sitting for an exam in april mm -hmm. which will be an exam which will be uh, 8 hours long mm -hmm. on a single day wow. where he will get one hour break which he can take either in 15 minute slots of 4 or 10 minute slots of 6 or whatever mm -hmm. and it's the only chance he will get wow if he fails in that exam then 
He cannot ever practice medicine. He can only go into a related adjunct field. You get it? Mm -hmm. Now, the fact of the matter is that the higher studies with technical studies, whether it's medicine or it's engineering, it does require some Correct. skill in rote learning. Yes. So you cannot say that rote learning is all bad. Yes. So as I said, that the policies that now that are being implemented either by, mm. see, I only know about CBSE because ours is a CBSE right. school right. and I am constantly working with our school mm. to see what is happening. And I can see for myself that where rote learning was 100% of the curriculum, today it's about not even 80%. I would say it's down to about 50 to 60%. 20% is devoted to your file work, your project work, your hands-on implementation of what you've been asked to do. And then there is these higher order learning skills, which we are encouraging children to develop. And there's at least 10% or 20% of an examination paper, which is not based on anything that you might have learned by heart, but how you apply all those policies and practices and theories that you have learned. So I think that the rigors of the Indian system are something that prepare us and our countrymen, mm -hmm. the educated countrymen, for a life of uh, hard work. And I don't think hard work is a bad thing. Absolutely. Hard work is, a, is perhaps the prerequisite for success in anything. Very well said. Very well said. So one of them, I'm going to keep moving on. Um, because I also want, I need time for to discuss your jewelry brand also. Oh, but yes. I've got two more questions for you on, on, on uh, New Era before I move on. Okay, uh, sure. You know, for someone who's in education, someone who's handling thousands and thousands of lives of children, yeah. what are some of the core values you believe in? I live by a mantra mm -hmm. which says, I mean what I say and I say what I mean. Well said. You know, I believe that if I have said something, I will stick by it. Mm -hmm. If I don't stick by it, then I have no place over there. Okay. That's one. Another one was taught to me by a colleague many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is a mantra for work. It's not a personal life mantra. Mm -hmm. So I was walking down the corridors in the school and uh, I probably saw her, wished her, didn't wish her. After school, she was quite close to me. We were friends. Mm -hmm other than being colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. She came to me after work and she said, uh, I saw you in the corridor today, but you had your this face on. Mm -hmm. Very often you have your this face on, wow. which is come say uh, hi. I understand. That day I determined mm -hmm. that if I'm at work, mm -hmm. I have no business to have this face. Wow. My face must always be welcoming mm -hmm. to every teacher and mm -hmm. every student in the school. Wow. I should smile more. I should be approachable. Mm -hmm. I should be the person that they think of when they're in trouble. Fascinating. And even if they're not in trouble, they should know this is a happy person. Mm -hmm. And we feel happy when he, we see her. Because if there's no happiness at work, then you better not work. So okay. that's my second mantra. Mm -hmm. And the last mantra for work, I think, is that what can be achieved with kindness, I think doesn't need stern action. So I'm a kind person. Fabulous, fabulous. So now I'm gonna move on to your jewelry brand, Vintage Intent. Mm -hmm. Tell me yeah. what made you start and tell me about the brand. Okay. So I'm a jewelry buff. I'm a good old Punjabi kudi. Okay who loves good clothes, uh, jewelry, and as luck would have it, uh, I've always lived in Delhi. I was born here, I was brought up here, I got married here. And um, well, by the grace of God, my parents were an upper middle class family. And uh, so, you know, 
you know i mean was three dhan and all that i mean uh, not i don't think they thought of that but it was the dumb thing that you know young girl getting married and all and i was always because i liked jewelry mm-hmm. now you know when you're married initially and you have all that jewelry you don't have too much money after that because you're trying to kind of make your life you know mm-hmm. your husband's just started his job you've just started working so how do i get more jewelry mm-hmm. okay so i realized very early on mm-hmm. that i could go to the jewel smith goldsmith with my gold jewelry and say okay i don't like this necklace can we break this up and you know put in a little more money yep. and make this into two necklaces mm-hmm. you know so that sort of thing so i kept doing that and to this day to my mother's dismay she said i don't think you have a single piece of jewelry that was given to you in your wedding you've changed everything i said so okay mama at least i'm wearing everything so i used to do that regularly and slowly as um, i started doing better in life my husband uh, did better i had more money to spend so i used to go and make more jewelry for myself mm-hmm. with one jeweler or the other and then came a time my daughter got married i was able to marry her off and give her the jewelry that i was very fond of myself and i gave her some of the pieces and then i realized that i had quite a few pieces still left mm-hmm. and my son was still younger and even when i gave my daughter in law i would have more pieces left over mm-hmm. but i still love the desire to create more mm-hmm. so i said no but i can't create more and keep storing them for what mm-hmm. because i think the thought of mortality had also started creeping in sure that um what should i do but i love the process of creation mm-hmm. so i told my husband you know i want to make and sell Mm. but i know only how to make mm. i don't know how to sell correct so he said well first of all you have to make to be able to sell correct selling comes later mm. so i said okay i i told myself i'm not going to make anything new i will pick up 15 pieces from my personal collection which i think uh kind of epitomize mm. what my creativity signifies to me mm. and so i did that and i put them on an online portal not my own i managed to find somebody who was ready to take them because they loved the pieces and i was very proud to see that within 6 months i think 13 out of the 15 pieces sold out wow and they really liked that and they said well go ahead now and so it's been 4 years now really? i'm uh mostly selling online mm-hmm. i'm not one of those people who encourages people to come to my home because my home is my personal space um unless it's a friend or somebody mm-hmm. and i would i want to go the online way and as a matter of fact with covid happening the way it did mm-hmm. online is possibly the way forward So I'm going to. I only have time for now two more questions for you. Okay. Two more questions for you personally. Yeah. My first question is that whether or for a life so well lived, achieved so much, even becoming a businesswoman now, as a jewelry designer. As you look back at life, what does success mean to Anna? Okay. Now you know this might sound. i don't know how it's going to sound but this is who i am okay i believe that giving is more important than receiving absolutely and i find that when i give of myself mm-hmm. and whatever i have mm-hmm. to whoever i can whether it's my own children my domestic help at home my driver my teachers who i love so much mm-hmm. my mother society around me the children of the school i believe i'm doubly bre- uh, doubly blessed because giving and receive actually in giving you are the first person who's receiving mm-hmm. is the self correct the extreme joy that i get in giving of whatever you know it could be just so let me share with you that i have never in my life i'm a good good cook fairly mm-hmm. good cook But I've never made any pickles in my life. Mm. And COVID happened, mm. 
and there was a mango tree in the schoolyard and one in our uh, my family has a little farm and there was a couple of mango trees there and i never even bothered about them and i just looked at them with so much fruit and i said hello ye to aise hi lage rahenge i told the mali as it utaro inko mere ghar bhejo i looked up a few recipes and i kid you not i made about 100 bottles of some mango chutney <laughs> and the next time i went to school for a meeting or something there were few and far between mm. i took all the bottles with me and i said okay whoever's coming for the meeting please take a bottle mm. and then the word got around and they said hello ma'am what happened where is our pickle yeah. i said listen the mango pickle is over now i'll try something else okay. so my point is that to me the opportunity to give for myself give of myself mm. in whatever way i can mm. to whoever i can is a measure of my success fabulous clearly fabulous who knows maybe we are going to now see a new brand vandana's pickles of india <laughs> who knows it could be yeah <laughs> okay. could be could be so vandana we run out of time thank you so much it's been such a pleasure speaking to you i love the journey that you took me through on education and i particularly loved what you told me about the teacher who you met which was not to put up your stop hand but to put up your welcoming hand welcoming hand i know such you a, know such a powerful that, uh, example i have i have so many anecdotes but i know we've run out of time and uh, thank you thank so you. much for having me thank you it's, it's been a pleasure speaking to pleasure thank you thank you thank you for listening to the brand called you video cast and podcast platform that brings you knowledge experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals you can also follow us on youtube facebook instagram and twitter just search for the brand called you